I would prefer to wait outside until you come back home. And just as you put your key in, I slide in with you with a gun, with a gun in your ribs. But by then, I'd already know what time your wife comes back from work, what time your kids finish school. And I already know that it's just us two because I've been studying your movements for the past couple of weeks. Tell me a bit about where you were born, Adam, and what your childhood was like. So, yeah, um, I was born in Uganda. Um, came here at the age of seven because of how my mum was when I was a kid. My mum was very strict um, and she wasn't very nurturing. So growing up as a kid, emotions weren't really a thing that was, you know, um, in, engraved in me, you know. My mum was very, she was very professional. She was a professional woman as in, in a sense of um, business-minded she provided, you know, um, but as far as the whole, you know, um, mother and son or mother and daughter type of aspect, it wasn't really, there wasn't really a connection. So I came here to the UK to live with my dad. This was in Canning Town, East London in Newham. To be honest with you, all I knew was just school and just home. My school was literally two minute walk from the house that I lived in. As I started progressing through school, you get, you know, you get to see older boys in, in the schools and outside schools and what people do outside schools. You know, um, we took a lot of influence from the older boys growing up. You know, they smoke weed and sell drugs and you see these things happening because you're not from a, a privileged background. You start growing a mentality or a mind frame thinking that this is a good way to earn a living or to, to, to make money. I haven't told anyone this, but the first time I ever got into like smoking weed, because it all just started off by smoking weed while I was still in school, someone dropped a weed bag that I knew, even though I used to hang around with him and I wasn't smoking at the time. Uh, I've seen the older boys roll up the weed and went back home, you know, try rolling it up. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Smoked it and then, I'm not gonna lie, the walls started like moving and stuff like that. And I was like, whoa, you know, this is insane. What is this feeling? And ever since after that, you know, um, started buying a bit of weed just to try and imitate the older boys. Then, you know, you got to fund your hab habit. I came into school with some weed. I think I must have been in year 10 at the time. And uh, I sold some weed to some kids in school. In the process of selling weed to these kids, I don't know, a, two, a set of two boys come up to me. They had some pocket money together or lunch money that they had collected and I gave them weed. I must have given them 10 pounds worth of weed. They went to the back of the music block in school, uh, you know, and smoked it. One of them had either an epileptic fit, some type of fit, and the other friend panicked, run, run around the, um, the playground looking for a teacher. Obviously the police gets called in because the ambulance has to come. The ambulance asks, what's wrong with the kid? You know, they say, uh, he's inhaled some weed, but he said he's got it from a student in year 10. In the process of panicking, I asked in the classroom, who's gonna help me, who can hide, hold on to this bag? Because I knew that the bag had what? The drugs in it. No one wanted to help me, but there was one boy that used to wedge you regularly. He stepped up and he said, I'll help you, Adam. So <laughs> I felt guilty. Um, why I've been doing the things that I've been doing to this boy, and now I'm in trouble and he's stepping up to help me. The police have come with the teacher. They've drew me out of the classroom. They've asked me, do you have a bag? You know, we've had reports that there's, you know, you bring drugs into school. And uh, I denied having a bag while I was in this room. As I'm in there being asked where the drugs are, I saw my bag being passed over. And it was the same boy that I had been wedging in school the whole time. After I got kicked out of school, I found out that this boy was a police cadet. That was the first time I ended up in a police cell. Yeah, that was the first time I was in a police cell and I had no idea, you know, if I'm gonna be going back to school, but I knew this is it for me, you know. Um, my mum was called, everything, you know. I kind of feel sorry for my mother now because she had no idea that I was doing those things in school. Um, I never went back to school, they permanently excluded me. How old were you when you got expelled? I was 15, I was 15 years old, but that, was the beginning of my life spiraling, spiraling out of control. I 
after getting kicked out of school, I ended up going to a school where all kids that get kicked out of school go. It's like a, it's like a community center. And from there, I um, obviously got as much GCSEs as I can. I applied for a college. But at the same time I was in college, I was still drug dealing. Uh, I was selling coke, cocaine, um, and weed. How much money were you making in a kind of typical week? Um, probably 2,000 pound. Drug dealing and guns go hand in hand. In that there's a lot of young boys, you know, you all get into fights and stuff like that. So I saved up, I bought a shotgun for 500 pound. It was a sawn off shotgun. With selling drugs, people get robbed. Uh, and I just had it just in case I needed, I, I needed to, you know, I wasn't ready to use it. I don't know why uh, I bought it, but just in case. And I had it stored um, in my uh, wardrobe. My mum going through my things, as a mother normally does with a son, she found the shotgun. And she, first thing that came to her was throw it in the bin. So she threw the shotgun in the bin. My sister told, came, to, came to me a couple of days later and said to me, hey, you know, mum found, found your gun. And I couldn't confront her about it. She never confronted me about it. Fast forward, still in college, but now I'm 17. I saved up enough money. Remember this was 3,000 pound. I bought a, a really powerful handgun, which was a, a 4.4 snub nose, like a three inch barrel, which was very easy to hide. I consistently used to keep it in a sock just in case I needed to fire it. I'll never need to put my gloves on, right? I'll just reach in my pockets and just press the trigger and fire the gun. I got very complacent, kept it, keeping it in my bedroom. My mum yet again went for my stuff, found the uh, uh, handgun or cannon, because it was like a cannon, right? That my mum, uh, took, she took it. This time I had to confront her. So I went looking for her, I said, mum, because she never said anything. I said, mom, you found something in my room? She said, yes. I said to her, um, I'm gonna need that back. She said, choose the house or the gun. And I chose the gun. She asked me to leave the house. And that's when I left the household at the age of 17. And then you ended up with a bounty on your head. How did that happen? When I was 17, that same year that I left the house, this young boy came to me and he said he had been beaten up by a group of boys. You know, even though I'm from an area that's in, that had gangs, me personally, um, I had a group of friends, three, four friends, because he came to us, we saw it as a obligation to go and help him. So we went and found the boys that had attacked him. We set up on the boys. But the little boy that came to me at my house, um, the younger boy, he had had a knife on him. He never told none of us he had a knife on him. In a process of beating these boys up, he produced a knife and stabbed one of the boys. And one of the boys that he had stabbed, his older brother was like the guy at the time that was like the top guy that was, you know, supplying drugs and stuff like that in the area. I'm the only one whose face they had clocked. So a hundred thousand pound went out and they put a hundred thousand pound on my head. And they said, dead or alive, they printed my pictures off of MySpace and distributed it to all the boys in the area, in the borough. And they said, this guy, as soon as you see him, give us a call. One time, I'm going to go and pick up drugs, you know, to break down and sell. Um, I, get, I get circled by the same group of boys that we had set up on. Cars had pulled up, motorbikes had pulled up. Boys I've never seen before, much older. So they set upon me, beat me with bike helmets, bike locks. I was knocked out unconscious, and while I was unconscious, uh, I got stabbed uh, in my abdomen with a, like a, as far as I'm aware, it was like a samurai, a little hand samurai that was soaked into my stomach while I was unconscious. I wasn't aware what was happening. So when I woke up, two weeks had gone by, I woke up with um, a tube in my uh, throat and um, things that help you wee and stuff like that in your private area and I had staples all across my stomach where I had been stabbed because the doctors had to open me up to try and look and see if, you know, stitch up where the damage had been done. That's when, instead of straightening out my path, 
I strayed even deeper into, into the game. Can you tell us about what led to your first time in prison? I'd built up a line. So a line, it's like a phone that you can ring when you need drugs in the locality that I'd grown up, which was Canning Town. Despite the fact that I had moved out of my mum's house, that's where I started. That's where my line started. So I'd always be around the area. I'm in my mum's house while I'm asleep, half asleep. I hear a helicopter above my room, jump out of my boxes, crapping myself. I'm thinking, what's happening? Run down the stairs. I don't know where I was running to, but I don't know. I was just running to find out what's going on. As I get to the bottom of the stairs, my door flies off. Nice arm police, shields. I can't see faces, but I've got about six, seven dots on my chest. So they're screaming different orders. Get on the floor, hands behind your back. Don't look at us, look the other way. I don't know what they want me to do first. So I get on my knees, I put my hands behind my back. You know, and then they tell me to stand up, come backwards with your hands behind your back. They arrested me. They searched the house for a gun, right? I'm 100% con I'm con con convinced I'm going to prison. I had, I had the gun and the coke and the weed plotted in the same area. So they searched the house and they didn't find it. Where I had hidden the drugs and the gun were in between the neighbors and my fence. Even if they did find it, you know, they're gonna have to prove that it's mine because now it's in a dodgy place, it's on a border. They didn't find it, they released me. So I'll go back inside my house, wait, wait for some time to go by I didn't want to go into my back garden and start rummaging and then the helicopter just pops out of nowhere, right? With the light, cool. But, so I didn't want to do that. So I waited for a little while, you know, never find anything. I proceeded like it's normal. The police come again. This time they've used the scaffolding, which was on the fourth floor. Armed police has come around the scaffolding and they've tried to force entry through the front of the door. I had the shotgun by the windowsill, right? So the door goes flying. You know, doof, doof, doof. you know, it's going, oh, police. I'm thinking, oh crap, these guys again, right? First thing that I do is I grab my shotgun by the windowsill, open the back door without looking up through the shotgun out. And they hit one of the armed officers that were on the scaffolding and he fell off the scaffolding. And then they jumped onto the balcony and proceeded to arrest me. And that was the first time I went to prison. How long did you go to prison for? They gave me three years, do 18 months. You know, you'd, you'd think anyone would learn from that, but, you know, 18 months later, I came out and that's when I got involved in serious crime. While I was in prison, I went from drug dealing and I took the trade or the uh, work of an armed robber on, but my type of work never involved commercial businesses. I would always target people involved in the same um, circle like in the same type of work, I rather cash. So I've done a few politicians, they had cash and this has come from a friend of theirs. How do you rob a politician? Um, it's all to do with mind frame. See me in my mind, as long as I convince myself, the first thing is to convince myself that I'm not doing anything wrong. Whatever is in that property already belongs to me. And then I plan on a smooth entry, you know, I would prefer to wait outside until you come back home. And just as you put your key in, I slide in with you with a gun, with a gun in your ribs. But by then, I'd already know what time your wife comes back from work, what time your kids finish school. And I already know that it's just us two because I've been studying your movements for the past couple of weeks. I watch you at work, you finish work. You know, um, I know what time you, you get back from work. I know what route you take to work, what route you can, when you come back from work. I know what, what, you know, how many dogs you got inside the house. You know, I know you got two kids, three kids, what school they go, what time they finish. The first thing that, you know, would come to my head, you know, am I going to be able to control that situation? I.e., weapon of choice, my briefcase was a shotgun, right? I entered the room, I'm controlling that situation. What was the most money that you made? from one armed robbery? The most that we made from one cash was near enough to quarter of a million to 300,000, but that was at a young age. In drugs, we've took more in drugs. How much? Um, in drugs, hundreds of thousands of, in drugs, you know. And how many armed robberies did you get? 
I'm not going to lie if I'm going to be honest. I don't know. I don't know, but I, wouldn't, I didn't have the name Ghost for no reason. I'm the type of guy that would always operate in the darkest corner of your street, you know? And I would just pop out of nowhere and just deal with the situation and leave immediately. How dangerous was that lifestyle? I, how I set up my life, you can only see me through um, appointment. I was consistently paranoid, you know? And like I've said to you, my circle of friends was two or three or four at most but not even they'll know where I'll be. So my whole movements will be um, randomized sequences. Not even I liked to know what I was doing at the time. So much so that I, wherever I go, I used to like control, like to control where I'm going. And I'll, I, I used to like to collect as much information about where I'm going and who's gonna be there and who's gonna be, you know. Other than that, I never used to venture outside my area unless it was business, you know. But business, will be anywhere, you know, in the UK. And then there was a robbery that went wrong. How did you end up getting arrested again? I got to a stage where I didn't do robberies anymore. Now I'm the, you know, I'm the, the person that sets them up. The person that has the stolen cars, the person that has the guns, the person that gets the calls for the robberies. Because I was successful, I used to put other people on robberies. One day I get a call, you know, from a guy. He's dating this girl and her brother is moving drugs selling drugs and it's got drugs inside the house. They've had arguments about um, the drugs in the house. And so the sister and the brother get into a fight. My sister rings her boyfriend to tell her boyfriend about it. The boyfriend knows me. The boyfriend tells me, gives me the address. When I get the address, um, I ring some boys and I uh, give them an opportunity to make some money. When I pick up the boys, the boys are a bit drunk. And, um, I proceed to take them. Something told me don't take them, but I agreed. I took the boys to this house. I drove them right outside the house. I pointed out the door. There was two red doors back to back. I should have knew better because they were tipsy. I let them get out the car. I gave them the gun to go in there and retrieve the drugs. I'm just down the road watching. I was, from, to me, it looked like it was the right house, but it was the wrong house. They come back inside the house. They were confused, they said there's no drugs in there. You know, there's a family in there, what the hell? I got a phone call from a Vietnamese guy that I used to deal with, he used to do like drugs, grow drugs. He was in South East London. He's telling me, I'm in a house in South East London. I just dropped off 30,000 pound. The woman's got the money machine out. She's counting all the money. There's 80,000 pound in the house right now. This is the address. So upon receiving this information, um, I told these boys, you know what, don't worry about that. We're going somewhere else right now. I was prolific like that. There'll be certain days I'll do two robberies, three robberies, or a shooting plus a robbery, or two shootings plus two robberies. I'm consistently at it. So we're driving. I remember I got to a place called Limehouse. So when I've done this dodgy U-turn near Limehouse, I bumped into city police who normally carry firearms and tasers and stuff like that. So they started following me. They followed me into, through Rotherhive Tunnel um, in, into South East London, right? This is near Bermondsey. So we've cut through, we're heading towards, um, we're heading towards uh, London Bridge. The car's crashed, right? The car's crashed. I've ended up going, uh, we ended up jumping out of the car. I've told the boys, do not follow me. Everyone split up, go their own separate ways. One guy was in a car, his job was to take the gun. He left the gun behind because he panicked. We've all run. Now these two boys are following me, even though I'm meant to depart and go out on separate ways. I've led them to the pier. So when we got to the pier, I can't swim. None of them can swim. We can hear the police running towards the pier. Oh, police, stop! They got the tasers out and everything. So from there, I got put in prison. And I didn't come out until 10 years later. I was 20. What was the point that you decided to turn your life around? So I spent five months in segregation. You know, I wasn't allowed to mix with other people in that precise moment. I had five months, no radio, no TV. I had two magazines that I was reading over and over and over and over and over. It's Groundhog's Day every day. 
you know, your mom dies, you're in prison. You know, your girlfriend that you was with at the time has moved on, got married, moved abroad. Your friends that you was with at the time have moved on. No one comes to see you. Your grandmother's passed away. Everything that you know, your whole world's come to a grinding halt and no one exists in that world that, than you. And the streets don't remember you. Your business partners don't remember you because you've been replaced and you're just stuck in that place, in a dark place. And there is no getting out of it. I'm not trying to glamorize violence, but like I've said, I've got an extreme personality. When I was in it, I was in it, you know. Now I'm trying to do good. I'm, I'm in that and I'm pushing positive energy. First, you gotta forgive yourself to move forward and you gotta, you know, give out apologies. And, and I'm talking about meaningful apologies to people. So I've done some of that while I was in prison. It's called restorative justice, where you get the police, your probation to try and reach out to the police to try and give the victims a chance to come in in a controlled environment and explain, because some people want to know, why did you do that to me? Who are you? What happened? You know, I need to know why and do we have a situation when you get out? Because I don't want people still living their lives through fear, thinking, oh my gosh, this maniacs are out, you know, my life's in danger. So before I even get out, I've got to try and straighten those um, issues out. You know. And what's your life like now? Everything's a blessing that I'm here. Even though I've gone for some But that's because I've done to people. You know, they got a saying, you do bad, bad follows. I'm here, I'm still alive. Now I've got to use this opportunity to shine a light on the dangers of having the wrong company and where that can lead to. I ended up getting married, you know. Um, and um, I work with, youths, trying to get them into employment. You know, I do some work in the university via teaching, right? So when people do come out of prison, I help them get the level twos, the level threes, find work um, and try to change their lives around because I know how it's like coming out with nothing. So I try to give back any way that I can to try and rectify the errors that I've made in my life. It's a fresh start for me. And my dad said, please, son, please, son. I was like, please, please, after what you've done to my fucking mum, yeah? Don't ever come back to my house. Do you understand me, mate?